If you've seen the Isekai videos, this is going to sound very familiar. This video was originally recorded and edited for the Anime North uh, Momiji online experience stream. It's a charity stream that they ran as a result of complications due to their on-site convention because of COVID. Uh, and, you know, I've always had a good experience with Anime North, so I thought it would be good to do, like, charity videos or, or, or whatnot. I don't know how to describe it, right? Uh, so this video is a condensation of the Apocalypse videos that I made, but with uh, quite a few changes. There's a few additions, there are some large omissions, and so on and so forth, but it's a general summary for an audience who might not necessarily know a lot about Apocalypticism. Now, I do want to mention that this video was shot, edited, and composed within a span of two days. So, if there's any editing snafus or anything like that, then I apologize, but that's just what happened. So yeah, let's give it a shot. So I want to start by saying that I'm going to be spoiling quite a few things as shown here. If you've ever seen Oba Sugumi and Oba Tatagishi's Death Note, you might know that the ending for the anime and the manga are different. In the anime, it ends on Light's death, his body on the stairs, Ryuk looks at the city, Misa, on the train, and then it cuts to black. But for the manga, the story is a little different. There's a time skip, Japan reverts, though they opine that that reversion is somewhat unfortunate. These criminal elements, which have been muted due to Kira, are back. On one hand, it emphasizes just how temporary Kira's solution is, but on another level, it also reveals somewhat inadvertently a particular kind of apocalyptic logic. Death Note stresses that the quintessentially malformed and unjust systems that led to the rise of Kira is greater than Kira themselves. For the manga in particular, by reverting back, it emphasizes cyclicality. The end isn't really just an end, but that the resilient society whose underpinnings can be glimpsed at, but not yet challenged. So what's going on? Why is this happening? And where does Death Note stand in the broader context of apocalyptic logic, especially Japanese apocalyptic logic? Hi there, my name is Joe, I run the channel Pause and Select, and I'm going to be talking about Japanese apocalypticism, how the end of an era, of a world, of a place, is imagined in anime and manga, and the socio-cultural forces that underpin it. So, what is apocalypticism? In short, apocalypticism refers to two general strains of imagination. One, it refers to what James Berger calls an alchemical shift, where a subject is hit or deals with what seems to be a fundamental transition in a pre-existing social order. The idea here, right, is that society is determined by its limit cases. The things that press against it and challenges to a pre-existing order are dealt with. But in order to keep our community safe and to protect our most vulnerable, we have to create a new normal. Here, Burge's apocalypse is a sort of sluicing, acidic imagination in which something reveals the bones of society, of ideology, of politics and order. But on the other hand, we have a more classical definition. Apocalypse is from the Greek root of apocalypse, which is focused on an unveiling or a revealing, and where we can immediately understand the circumstances that allow us to realize that something else is afoot. This is particularly important if we think about apocalypse as a revelation that leads you to a truth of society. Both feed into the other. The disastrous imagination can reveal the limitations and difficulties of pre-existing social orders, unveil what doesn't actually work, and how new imaginations can arise. At the same time, a sense of revelation can feel or be incredibly alienating. In other words, the apocalyptic text is one of the barest, clearest ways in which subjects of an ideology might imagine a way out. So here's the question. What's going on in Japan?
I want to stress that historically, Japan's apocalyptic texts were largely tied to the land. According to Motoko Tanaka, apocalyptic rhetoric was largely a resource-based concern. When people lost faith in local governments, for instance, you saw an explosion of apocalyptic rhetoric, and this largely survived in a lot of different ways. The idea of wa, of a particular kind of harmony, is essential here, a harmoniousness that inhabits its own precarity. The physical dangers facing Japan as an island in the ring of fire also means that a particular set of cultural values are maintained. But at the same time, you also have concepts like Mappo, Buddhist apocalypticism, which signifies the end of Dharma. And apocalyptic texts, while they were around for a really long time, really exploded with the introduction of Western science fiction in the early 1900s. Simon Newcomb's 1903 story, The End of the World, or Camille Flammarion's Last Days of the Earth, for instance, were among them. But when we're talking about contemporary Japanese apocalyptic imaginations, we really can't ignore its major dramatic shift as a result of the Second World War. Japan went from an imperial totalitarian state to a modern democracy. The emperor, whose voice was largely hidden from commoners, was broadcast on radio for the first time, announcing the country's surrender. The atom bomb, a dramatic expression of force and devastation, followed prolonged firebombing campaigns, and of course, Japan remains the only country so far to have felt the brunt of a nuclear attack. And really, there is nowhere is this as clear as Ishiro Honda's 1954 film, Gojira. Gojira is and remains one of the great titans of nuclear anxiety. Initially, it was supposed to be a war film. However, due to political tensions in Indonesia where it was meant to be filmed, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka had to drastically change the plot. It's not entirely clear where Gojira exactly came from. Some people argue it's a reference to the beast from the 20,000 Fathoms. Others argue it's based off a co-worker. Others argue it's a portmanteau of Kujira and Gorira. And the truth kind of flits between all three. What is clear, however, is that Ishiro Honda's Gojira examines these incredibly clear references to nuclear anxieties. For instance, the film begins with fishermen shocked and stunned by the emergence of something from the waters, and it's a direct reference to the Lucky Dragon incident in 1954, where fishermen were hit with radiation poisoning due to being so close to the Castle Bravo testings at the Bikini Atoll. Thus, in this case, Ishiro Honda's original film wasn't just a monster movie, but also an emblematic tale of what Jerome Shapiro called atomic cinema, films that typified the nuclear anxiety that existed in Japan after the bomb. But it's largely the bomb. And Gojira wasn't the only one. Shuei Matsubayashi's The Last War from 1961 captures similar sentiments. The film ends unceremoniously on a massive crater that used to be Tokyo. And this is not even to mention things like hibakusha literature, which are stories about those who survive or are grappling with the effects of the bomb. The atomic apocalypse would last throughout contemporary Japan as functionally both spectacle and a persistent, continuous concern. But at the same time, it's not the only thing that's going on. Japan would be dealing with massively testy and uncertain political and social unrest. The thuggish politics of Nobusuke Kishi and the CIA, and Japan's uneasy position as a democratizing state in the Soviet sphere, meant that not only was it a necessary bulwark against communism, but that communism also emerged in distinctly different ways. Pushed by numerous worker and especially student groups, Japan generated a flurry of socialist, Marxist, and communist movements, with some of them still active today. These groups, in effect, represented an idealistic pathway for Japan that with a new nation, there was a real opportunity to be able to shape it in a way that felt possible. It was, in effect, a kind of cluster of utopian visions, but it's with the actions of the United Red Army, the Rengo Sekiku, at Asuma Sanso in 1972 that undermined the legitimacy of these groups. In a shootout with the police at the Mountain Lodge, the Rengo Sekiku members had drastically undermined these idealistic movements, and with the strong post-war economy recovery, it seemed that the right way to proceed with Japan's future was an economic one. 
But here's the problem. It's only a year later that that economic power would be questioned with the OPEC oil crisis. With supplies projected to run critically low, Japan's economy seemed incredibly frail. In that climate, we got Sakyo Komatsu and Shiro Moritani's film and novel, Japan Sinks. Both focus on the idea of what happens when Japan is physically sinking into the ocean. And the question isn't how to save the islands, but more so how to save its people. But if those people, right, are going elsewhere, being taken in by others, then what would make them Japanese in one or two generations? Is it their language, their blood, their products? These texts were trying to figure out what Japanese-ness means, especially given that Komatsu had begun writing this in 1964, the same year as the Tokyo Olympics. And thus he was grappling with whether this new generation, who only knew a developed post-war Japan, was reshaping what it meant to be Japanese. And what that means in the context of a process, if you're Japanese, if your subjectivity is always shifting. And while Japan Sinks is immediately influential from a financial perspective, clocking in even more than Gojira's initial run, we can really see the question of Japanese identity and history mashed up together in another text, in Katsuhiro Otomo's titanic double feature, Akira. As both a manga and a film, Akira is a pastiche of every apocalyptic sentiment that came before it, focused around Neo-Tokyo, a new space that emerged after a mysterious explosion in 1988. Akira's Tokyo is one of incessant, unrepentant consumption. Bikers Kanada and Tetsuo come across an esper, and from there the story kind of unfurls violently. Akira is more known for its stunning full animation and its stunning apocalyptic imagination that remains even unto today. But at the same time, Akira also reveals so much of Japan's apocalyptic imagination. Not only are the rebels reminiscent of some of these communist and Marxist movements that populated Japan, but the demonstrations themselves are reminiscent of the student political movements that lasted from the 50s up until the 70s. Kanada and Tetsuo themselves are what Susan Napier notes are Shinjinri, new human beings, or people who grew up and became of age in the 70s and thus would have really only known a developed Japan. It's unsurprising, after all, that Kanada has no reverence for the crater at Old Tokyo, which itself is a reference to the ending of the last war. Like Japan Sinks, Akira is focused on trying to understand what defines the quintessential Japanese identity, but it also has an increasingly critical element, religiosity. See, in the 70s, after the effects of Japan's oil shock, Japan underwent a huge germinal period for religious cults known as the Shinshukyo, or New Religions. These groups, with a subsection called the Hyper Religions, adopted tenets increasingly outside of Japanese culture, notably foreign pseudoscience, mysticism, and psychology. You can see it in Lady Miyako, whose character is largely reverent of the new spiritual age that Akira is supposed to usher in. But that new age can only be possible through the annihilation, or in the case of Tetsuo, subsumption of the old one. Thus, what's happening here is a capture of Japan's post-war period. That beginning from the bomb, Akira reflects the Japanese apocalyptic zeitgeist from then on, defined by the loss of major political and social grand narratives, a shift towards an economic grand narrative, and a generation that lacks the encapsulation of a clear transition from one to the other. And as we see in Akira, the transition towards a new world is possible, perhaps only possible, through a reimagination of some of these new religious movements, these new imaginations. This sense of newness, a completely separated and yet entirely obscured newness, can be understood in the era that follows, known by Masuchi Osawa as Ryoko no Jidai, or the Age of Fiction. The age here is defined by consumption and dreams and imagination, buttressed by Japan's strong economy, its seemingly firm social structure, and its benign and seemingly effective governmental order. 
But then something happened. Or should I say some things? Stay with me here. It's 1989. The bubble economy burst, beginning the long period of decline known as the lost years. Although it took a few years for the immediate effect to be felt, the impact was devastating. Unlike the oil crisis of 1973, this wasn't an anxiety. This happened. As a result, one of the major changes was the popularization of Hotkin, or temporary workers. And the effects of these would really start to show themselves in the early 90s. And when the bust came, and Japan's overinflated speculative bubble popped, the impact on Japanese politics, society, and culture, not to mention its economy, was little short of devastating. But as devastating and as long-reaching as the bubble burst was, it was only one out of three major disasters to hit Japan in that time period. On January 17, 1995, a 7.2 magnitude quake struck Kobe, Japan, being, according to the NIST, the most severe earthquake to affect that region this century. It led to over 6,000 deaths and over 30,000 injuries, its damage clocking in at around $200 billion. The devastation captured on news feeds remaining imprinted in Japanese disaster imagery even unto today. And yet, even then, that wasn't the only disaster. Two months later, on March 20th, 1995, high-ranking members of the cult Om Shinrikyo punctured bags of impure sarin on the Tokyo subway, leading to 12 deaths, a thousand injuries, and a temporary closure of the subway trains. This was particularly important considering that Ohm had a strong fascination with pre-existing apocalyptic anime like Nausicaa, up to and including referencing it outright in their magazines. So think of it this way. How would you feel if 9-11, the 2008 housing crisis and Hurricane Katrina all happened in the span of two to three years? It would really feel like there was something immense happening, that something truly apocalyptic was going on. And it's in that sort of mindset, that eschatological fever, that Japan watched Neon Genesis Evangelion. Gainax's Neon Genesis Evangelion, while it was airing at the same time as some of these events, is nevertheless signal boosted and aided by the ongoing cultural sentiments of the time. The sense of precarity and the nationwide uncertainty in the face of these disasters hugely fed into Eva's imagination of not only a submerged Japan, but captures a desire to retreat. In this situation, Eva could be seen as a sort of loss of trust and faith in a pre-existing social and political order, that there exists only immediate, close personal relations against the onslaught of oncoming catastrophe. Remember, each of the disasters around that period are seen partly as failures of the social and collective order. The Nikkei stock crash was a failure of Japan's faith in its post-war economic boom. Because of large recovery efforts by citizens groups, the Kobe earthquake was seen as a failure of statewide responses to emergencies. And the Ohm attack was seen as a sort of spiritual failure, a loss of hopeful imagination at the end of the age of fiction of Kyoko no Jidai. The solution, in some senses, seemed to be retreat, and thus we would see the popularization of what are called sekaike, or world-type stories. There's a lot of debate on what necessitates sekaike, but they largely refer to disaster stories involving a romantic plot between a boy and a girl where the girl fights, and wider society is often avoided or obscured. Their relationship ultimately ends up depending on the fate, and vice versa, the fate of the world depends on them. Eva is considered the grandfather of Sekaike work. This would really go into Germany in the early 2000s with much more clearly Sekaike works such as Iria no Sora, Voices of a Distant Star, and Saikon to be the big three. 
Here we see a popularization of a kind of retreat apocalypse, a certain textual logic promulgated through Japan's otaku community as they found themselves unable or unwilling to face the increasingly precarious positions of these triple disasters. It seemed on this end that the right thing to do was to retreat. For some, Sekaike has a sort of hikikomori logic, acting as a sort of fatalist apocalyptic text. But even that was insufficient, because it was even less than a decade later that something else happened, and this time, it wasn't in Japan. In Zero Nendai no Sozo Ryoku, The Imagination of the 2000s, Uno Sunihiro argues that in the early 2000s, there ended up being two major events shaping the way in which Japanese apocalyptic fiction was understood. On one hand, due to the events of 9-11, the idea of a retreat, a hikikomori sensibility as he noted, was becoming increasingly untenable. The problem, Sinhiro notes, is that there is no place to retreat to if Japan was on the brunt of something like what happened in 2001. Thus, even though it might be painful, the best option for people uncertain about their futures was to just try and make something of their lives. But there's a problem. At the same time, then Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi was implementing a series of neoliberal reforms which greatly limited the longevity and the stability of much of Japan's workforce, up to and including a deregulation of labor, especially an expansion of contract work, an imposition of results-based employment, and a massive deregulation of public service work in the name of work-style diversity. Thus, in this sense, not only was a sense of retreat not even encouraged or possible due to the events of 9-11, but because of these reforms, there was a sense of really, truly alienating environments in which young people are forced to compete against each other. This is what Tsunohiro calls sabaibuke, or survival-type fiction, where people must combat each other to get to the top, but to do so demands that they understand the rules of the game. Compared to the sekaike that preceded it, these survival-type stories completely disengage with the idea of close relations as a stand-in for larger political and social ones. Instead, the only thing that matters is the mentality that thriving is synonymous with surviving. Here's where we come back to Death Note. Death Note as a battle to the death between young people is what Motoko Tanaka and Ueno Sunihiro consider to be quintessential examples of the survival type story. And while at glance it might not seem to be apocalyptic, it nevertheless embodies much of the revelatory spirit of classical apocalypticism. To Ueno, these young competitors are the only ones who realize the true conditions of society as it presents itself to them, a brutal Hobbesian and collision of competitors who must ultimately fight against each other in this new environment. In this sense, it is an unveiling, a realization of the true nature of society. Kira and L's confrontation is not just a cat and mouse drama, but emblematic of the ongoing pressures young people feel in a world in which they're increasingly sick of, and also have no other option but to navigate these rules if they want to change any of it. However, that mentality also, quite literally, came crashing down. On March 11, 2011, a nine magnitude earthquake struck the Tohoku region. According to Richard Lloyd Perry, it was the biggest earthquake ever known to have struck Japan, and the fourth most powerful in the history of seismology. It knocked the earth 10 inches off its axis. It moved Japan four feet closer to America. In the tsunami that followed, 18,500 people were drowned, burned, or crushed to death. At its peak, the water was 120 feet high. Half a million people were driven out of their homes. Three reactors in the Fukushima Daiichi power station melted down, spilling their radioactivity across the countryside. The world's worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl. The earthquake and tsunami caused more than $210 billion of damage, making it the most costly natural disaster ever. It was Japan's greatest crisis since the Second World War. And it was in this meltdown, this earthquake, this tsunami, that led to the creation of Makoto Shinkai's Your Name, and Hideaki Anno and Shinji Higuchi's Shin Gojira.
Both your name and Shin Gojira are tackling disaster imaginations, but in very different ways. Shinkai, coming from a lineage of Agaoge writers and directors, as well as one of the big fathers of Sekaike apocalyptic texts, is attempting to understand how Japan, especially its young people, are dealing with the disaster so many years later. The connection between Taki and Mitsuha, when it's revealed to be a disconnection between time, is functionally a metaphor for the disconnection of the displaced Japanese through space. Communication played a fundamental role in galvanizing large community efforts in disaster recovery, and it's no surprise then that the connection between Taki and Mitsuha depended on these baikai, or medium, which itself took on the form of cell phones. This is particularly pressing when you consider that during the offense of Fukushima Daiichi, because of the massive infrastructural damage, more cloud-based communications such as LINE became incredibly vital for people to communicate and coordinate relief efforts. Thus, in this sense, your name encapsulates not only the traumatic event of historical puncture that disasters and apocalyptic imagination embody, but at the same time acts as a sort of warning against the erasure of these events. Taki's lamentation at the interview in Tokyo is striking. He stresses that he wants to better the infrastructure of the city, primarily because a disaster can hit at any moment. And your name was not the only film in 2016 to emerge. Hideaki Anno and Shinji Hyukuchi at the same time released Shin Gojira, itself a reimagination of Ishiro Honda's 1954 film, but set in the modern day. However, what's striking about Anno and Higuchi's Gojira is how they attempt to grapple with the threat. It's not the bomb, but one of nuclear power, an examination of a new sort of order in which Japan finds it exceedingly difficult to separate its energy grid and the disastrous consequences its failure brings. According to Thomas Lamar, Shin Gojira is focused on the logistics of evacuation, a sort of operational logic out of how we get people out of the disaster, where your name borrows from the logic of the Kobe earthquake, which itself was spearheaded by citizens groups, Shin Gojira actually focuses on the other end, an examination of Japan's languid and testy bureaucratic politics in the face of its nuclear crisis. Japan as it stands is currently in a new apocalyptic zeitgeist, in a space that could scarcely be called post-Fukushima as its tendrils remain, the memory of its disasters embedded so much in what we still see today. And while the oil crisis is an economic concern, and the Kobe earthquake and the Ulma attacks are social concerns, 311 was an energy concern. It shook the fundamental tenets of a comfortable Japan. Manga scholar Jacqueline Burnt once described driving down the highways of Japan during the 311 disaster as eerie and difficult because the lights, for the first time in a long time, were off. An artist and writer, Kentaro Takekuma, described the ultimate fortress of the comfortable otaku, the konbini, these large 24-7 convenience stores, as, for the first time in a long time, they were off. Thus, in this sense, the imagery and sensation would birth a new apocalyptic imagination, a suspension of comfortable everydayness, affecting every citizen. But on the subject of citizens, I think it makes sense to end with where we are now. And now, in 1964, the 18th, in Tokyo, Japan, As I said before, Komatsu Sakio began writing Japan Sinks in 1964, the same year as the Tokyo Olympics. There, at that stage, there was a raucous and absolutely stunning display of post-war Japan's recovery. In fact, according to Steinberg, there were two major reasons 
as to how Japan's televisual culture became so ubiquitous. The first was the publicized marriage of Emperor Akihito to Empress Michiko, and the second was the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. It's appropriate, then, that I think Yuasa's 2020 Japan Sinks not only ends in a celebration of Tokyo's now-failed Olympics, but also at the same time, it's being broadcast on Netflix. Japan Sinks has largely been a product to be placed on film, and with COVID and with changes in broadcasting technologies, it's unsurprising in both apt that a new Japan Sinks, a new apocalyptic text, would attempt to recapture this specific moment, this specific era, in a way different from its predecessors. And this is even more important, considering that when we look at the grandfather of Japanese apocalyptic science fiction, Komatsu Sakyo, he passed away in 2011, only a few months after Fukushima Daiichi. His last moments, in effect, were to witness a new order of Japanese apocalyptic imagination. Japan has historically carried many disaster imaginations because it was a country that was defined so strongly and so heavily based upon the disasters it frequently deals with. But those disasters arrive and show themselves in so many senses that it can become or feel not only discombobulating but also desensitizing. I think on some sense we can't forget that every disaster is new and real and tangible to the people who have to deal with it. And over the course of the ages, there will invariably be new ways to imagine them. So first off, thanks for watching. If you came to this channel and you're new, um, thank you very much. Uh, if you like the video, please do like and subscribe. Uh, I know the call to action is really meme -y and all that kind of stuff, but it is kind of important and it does work. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people might notice is that I had some major omissions, right? Like, for example, why didn't I talk about Haruki Murakami's uh, Hard Boiled Wonderland? Or why did I not talk about Yokohama Kaida Shikiko and the idea of Owari Naki Nichijo and the endless every day and all that kind of stuff uh, in regards to that particular like line or like lineage, right? And the answer, the simple answer is I had 30 minutes and I had to condense a lot of information into 30 minutes, but at the same time, I didn't want it to essentially just be a constant bombardment of information. I wanted it to have some kind of a pace. So the question of right, uh, the question right is, if I'm writing this for an audience that is new to this but might not necessarily have uh, the interest in continuing forward, but they just might be uh, tangentially interested or just interested by proxy or drive by, or just, I have no, I have no idea. I have to be able to condense a sort of kind of particular narrative. Now that's not to say that um, that's not to say that what I omitted is not important. I do definitely think it is important, but I think it largely opens up a lot more doors than I'm able to close within the time span that I have. And so that's why I didn't talk about them. If you don't know what I'm referring to, you might be interested in my Understanding Disaster Part 4, which talks a little bit more about the idea of everydayness, Nichijouke, uh, Kukike, and we've got, like, say, Gakko Gurashi, even though I don't mention it, Gakko Gurashi and the idea of Kirara and sort of like everyday apocalypse kind of things. Those particular perspectives are incredibly important, and you might find those particularly interesting if you're not entirely sure about what some of that element might mean. You know, like the whole Miyadai Shinji element, I just completely missed. But yeah, once again, this video has been brought to you by the uh, fantastic help of patrons. Uh, I know that calling uh, the, the, the whole Patreon call thing is incredibly cringy, but it is a kind of a necessary process in this whole thing. And that's why the names are running up on the side as I was speaking. So huge thanks to everybody on that. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the video that already played. <laughs>